this last week we had the movie night. So we're in Proverbs 25. Uh, before we get going, did anybody have any questions about anything in Proverbs that we've been studying or something that you read ahead on? No? Okay, cool. So 25.1 starts with, um, with Hezekiah's uh, scribes. These also are Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. Now, in, from this part on in Proverbs, things get a little bit more complicated, a little more complex. Up to this point in Proverbs, it's been pretty simple, straightforward Proverbs, but after 25, things just get a little bit harder. Um, so for that reason, we're going to look at a lot more verses than we had been looking at before. Um, you'll notice that through the notes, like, and sometimes, like, just verse after verse, I have to explain it going to because it's just more complicated. Um, it is the glory of God to consider things, but the glory of kings is to search them out. So the idea here is that God's ways are undiscernible. Um, what is the word? Uh, undiscernible. Indiscernible. Okay. But kings, as kings, they have to be transparent. They have to explain to their subjects what they're doing. And when they bring about justice, it is considered their glory, the thing that the things that their 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 subjects trust in them for to reveal things. You know what I mean? To, to search things out, to discover things. Um, Whereas God is, it, 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 the contrast here is that God's ways you don't know, but a king's ways he has to make his ways known, or else he'll lose his power. Yeah. You know. Um, and then verse three, as the heavens uh, for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. So this seems, sounds like it's directly in contrast with what we just read, and that's because it is. It, the men, it, three is meant to contrast with two, and the idea is a king has a has to plan for the future and keep, but some things. Are just confident, and as a king, you're not going to be able to be completely transparent, you know, um, because you have to plan for things that, that the general population doesn't. You, you know what I mean? I, I, that doesn't really make sense to us because we believe in the republic, you know, we believe in democracy, those kinds of things. But at this time, remember that kings were were that's just kind of everybody had kings, you know. Um, so, anyways. Um, and so the idea here is that, yes, uh, the glory of kings is to search things out. However, their ways are unsearchable. So it's like you got a little bit of a contrast there that sounds like a, a what's it called, paradox, a contradiction. Yeah. Take away the dross from the silver, uh, and the smith has material for a vessel. Take away the wicked from the presence of the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. These two verses are connected, um, as you can probably tell, and the idea here is that just as, as silver, you know, once the dross has been taken out, you can you can make something good from that silver. Uh, dross is, is when you heat silver and that that waste material that, that that separates that you separate from the metal. That's that's called dross. Um, so uh, the idea here is that wicked people can negatively impact a king, um, you know, when they're when they're around him. So it, it, to, for a king to have more righteous decisions. You would want to remove the wicked wicked people from his presence, just like you would move, remove dross from silver to have something usable. Right. So, um, do not put yourself forward in the king's presence, or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, "Come up here," than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. And this is actually one that Jesus talked about too. Um, not expecting respect uh, respect from people because lest you lose your respect in front of everybody, you know. And uh, the idea here, I mean, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward in English as well. Um, you know, don't don't expect a place of, of respect among the king, uh, and then if he calls you up, you get extra uh, respect because the king himself called you for it. You know what I mean? Whereas if you put yourself in a place of respect, and then to be put down, that would be complete disrespectful. So, um, how does this apply to us today? Don't expect respect from people. You know, be humble, and if people choose choose to treat you in a disrespectful way, let it go. Yeah. You know, just let it go. Whenever you get upset about you know people disrespecting you, just remember that Jesus was completely disrespected, and uh, he still did what he still stayed true to his character, which was God, you know. And so if you're disrespected, if you're treated wrong, you can still stay, stay true to God's character, right? Seeking after Him and focusing your attention on that. And uh, you see a lot of people, um, kids especially, are are real bad about this. Um, teenagers. You know, I, I deserve to be treated treated equal because, you know, I just deserve that. But then, you know, they try and give themselves honor and it just backfires and bad things. So verse, um, it, it's actually the end of verse 7 and verse 8. What uh, what your eyes have seen, do not hastily bring into court. For what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? 
The idea here is sometimes things aren't what they seem. If you if you rush things to court because it looks like that that's how it is, you might be shamed because that's not actually how it was. You know, oh, I saw them do this, and it's like, well, actually, no, that just looked like that. You know, uh, verse nine uh, seems like it's talking about the same thing, but it's similar things, but it's really not. Uh, argue your case with your neighbor himself, and do not reveal another secret, lest he who hears you bring shame upon you, and your ill repute have no end. And the idea is this: if you have a private quarrel with somebody, you you should keep it private between them. In fact, boop. Uh, and uh, if you go about, you're in this private quarrel with somebody and you make it public knowledge by talking to somebody else about it, a third party that has nothing to do with it, um, what's going to happen is eventually you're going to get shame on yourself and people are going to know you as this person who's just a, a, a gossip, a, a complainer, a, um, a backbiter. You know, they're not going to trust you. You're going to you're going to earn a bad name for yourself. Um, so that takes us to verse uh, 11, I think. Let me check. Yeah. Uh, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Now, this one has many different translations, but in order to keep things simple, I decided to just stick with the translations in most Bibles. Um, basically, when your words are used well, they, they have good benefit. That's you know simple enough. Um, apples of gold is somewhat um, questioned as to what that exactly means, and there's different ways it could possibly tra be translated. But don't lose the forest for the trees here. It's basically a, a word fitly spoken uh, when, when you use words well and, the, and that good effect that it has. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wiser prover to a listening ear. So the thing that is considered an ornament of gold is a wiser prover. Okay. The thing that is considered an ornament of gold too is a, is a listening ear. Um, and so the idea here, blam, the lasting benefit of um, reproving people who have the wisdom to listen. Um, obviously, you know, if, if, if you're full and you're not listening to advice, it's not going to really accomplish anything. Uh, verse 13, like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who sent him. Have you guys ever worked during harvest time? Really hot. Really hot. Like the cold of snow in the time of harvest. Can you imagine how refreshing that would be if you're out in the fields? Yeah. In a time of harvest, it's really hot. This is a faithful messenger to those who sent him. He refreshes the soul of his masters. And the idea here it goes beyond just a messenger. Faithfulness is refreshing. When you do what you were sent to do, when you stick true, stick true to what you said you were going to do, that, that's just the refreshment that comes with that. You know, if you really want to encourage your spouse, one of the best ways to do it is to stay faithful to them. You know, um, not obviously not the only way. For all the guys out there uh -huh. who say, "Why do I have to say I love you? I told you when we got married." <laughs> so, anyways, uh, verse fourteen: Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift that he does not give. That one, that makes me laugh. Like clouds and wind without rain. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyways, with patience a ruler may be persuaded, and a soft tongue will break a bone. Now this one's Speaks especially tact when you're talking with people. If you if you bring somebody up to some if you bring something up to somebody and they're hesitant towards it, if you're patient and you continue to bring it to them, not in a nagging way, but in a gentle way, I guess you could say, kind of ease them into it. Eventually, you can win them over to to, to what you want. With patience, a ruler a ruler may be persuaded, or you could get real mad and throw a fit. Or you could just get your feelings hurt that they didn't listen to you and leave. Or you could be patient and you might win them over. And then the second thought goes along with it. And a soft tongue, soft tongue that speaks of gentleness, um, will break a bone. In other words, um, obviously uh, your literal tongue will not break a bone. Basically. <laughs> uh, the tongue being uh, the sense of talking, you know, um, the, the soft word, the soft answer, uh, will break something as strong as bone. Um, so if you have found honey... If you have found honey, eat only enough for you, lest you have your fill of it and vomit it. And the idea there is pretty simple. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Right. <laughs> Let your foot be seldom in your neighbor's house, lest he uh, have his fill of you and hate you. This doesn't just go with neighbors. This goes with friends and that kind of stuff, too. You don't want to overburden your friends. And, and, I, and you hear people say, say it something like this. Well, if you can't... If, if your friends aren't there for you, then they really aren't friends in the first place. Uh, yes, I, I kind of see what you're saying there, but that's not really what he's saying here. His point is, um, if you 
overtax people if you... What's another word that I'm looking for here? Um, okay, let's say you have a neighbor who has a bunch of tools and you don't have any tools. And so you're over there every day or every other day borrowing their tools. Well, eventually they're going to get tired of you coming over all the time. Yeah. yeah obviously, yes, a true friend is, is one who's there for you in your time of need. Obviously, they're right. okay, absolutely. Yeah. But there comes a point also, even with like issues where you refuse to face them and you're constantly leaning on somebody else. Um, you see that people do this uh, with pastors and stuff too. I don't really want to seek God, so you keep seeking God and you tell me what He says. And it's like, well, that's not really how this works, you know. But anyways. It wasn't me, I swear. Is there soda that splattered under there? It's okay. The mice are drinking it now. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, a man who bear, bears false witness against his neighbor is like a war club or a sword or a sharp arrow. And the idea here is he's dangerous. Um, people got There's a lot of commentaries who kind of get a little bit carried away with this one. Let's keep it simple. Um, oftentimes, um, like it's been said many times, the most simple answer is oftentimes the correct one. You know, sometimes we try to confuse things. And um, <clears throat> trusting in a treacherous man in times of trouble is like a bad tooth or a foot that slips. And both of these things, if you notice, are painful and ineffective. Right? A bad tooth that's painful. You can't keep going with it with a bad tooth. Uh, a, foot that, a foot that slips. If you have like a sore ankle, for instance, how many of you can just keep on running when you've twisted your ankle? See I mean? Well, you can, but that's different. Um, well, I can try until it gets worn. Yeah, but you probably shouldn't do that, Zach. Don't do that. <laughs> get, wear a brace or something. Don't do that. <laughs> did I get that? Yes, I did. Um, well, let me double check something real, guys, real quick, guys. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, okay, we're good. There we go. Uh, so then, um, try, uh, okay, 20. Whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day. And like vinegar on soda. Now, there's a few different ideas here. One is... Um, if you're uh, rejoicing openly when somebody else is mourning, they're going to see it as an annoyance. But another idea that, that a lot of people hint, uh, talk about with this one is that if there's someone who is uh, struggling with someone, not so much if you aren't there for them, but if you try and like just play off or you know just sing the song, you know, kind of treat, treat it flippantly, um, that that can be something that makes it worse. Now, he uses two different examples to say this. Uh, the first thing that he uses is like taking off a garment when it's cold. In other words, you've got a jacket on, right? And it's cold, and you take the jacket off. It's an annoyance. It's, 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 not, it's not something good. But then the same thing is like vinegar and soda. Now, obviously, this is not talking about the kind of soda that you guys are drinking tonight. Okay. <laughs> sodium. And soda refers to sodium carbonate. Um, and then when mixed with vinegar, I'm going to show you that in just a second. Um, and the idea there is, once again, um, you know, James talks about this when he says, uh, mourn with those who mourn, or rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Now, I have here sodium carbonate, and I also have here vinegar. Okay. Now, I want you guys to see what happens when you mix, mix this, and this is what the, what this is talking about. Okay. Uh, do you guys want to lean in, or, or no? Can you guys all see it? See how it irritates it? Mm -hmm. Causes it to bubble up like that. Okay? That's what rejoicing is to someone who's mourning. It, it, it irritates things. Yeah. It's not going to go over well. You know, we need to be. And the idea here is that we need to be sensitive to people who are who are in, in times of trouble. Right. You know, and the thing is, that's especially hard um, as as a as a worship leader because you want to lead the congregation in songs that are uplifting, but at the same time. You can't sing songs about things that your congregation isn't at. You know what I mean? You have to sing songs with where your congregation is at. When I first got here um, to do worship, I start. I was doing a lot of hymnals. But now, I don't do any, any hymnals anymore. No hymnals. Right. At all. See what I mean? Why? Because that's where they were back then. But we're going somewhere else now. You know what I mean? And, and, and they're going somewhere else now. You know, and 
it kind of, if I ever go to another church where I have to do worship, and that's where they're at, well, then I'll go back to that. See what I mean? Because as a worship leader, you have to be kind of flexible. And that's exactly what I'm saying with this verse, too. When there's someone who's mourning, you have to be flexible with them. Okay? It's obviously easier to just go to them and say, well, this is how you should be feeling. But it's going to be like vinegar on, on, on sodium and carbon, okay? And it's going to be irritating things. So we really have to watch out for how we say things. Um, and how we react to people, too. Okay? Um, but also, everybody, every person mourns differently. Yes. That's so true. it could change very on, varying by the situation. Yes. Which is, what, once again, why I want to say that, about be sensitive to the other person's needs. Okay. <coughs> um, okay. Verse 22 through, uh, 20, 21 through 22 are actually quoted by Paul in uh, Romans. Um, so... Okay, let's read it through. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Now, Paul uses it in a different context. Okay, so when Paul uses it, it has a slightly different meaning. Go and read Romans through uh, if you want to see how the little subtleties there. But in the context of Proverbs, what it's saying is that when you treat somebody well, even in spite of them mistreating you, it's going to cause, it's going to, bring guilt to their conscience. It's going to make them feel bad. It's going to be like burning coals on their head. See what I mean? Um, if you treat people how they deserve to be treated, well, then their, their anger towards you is going to be further justified. The bad thing that they're going to, doing is going to be further justified because you're kind of a douche. But if you treat them well in spite of them mistreating you, then it'll be like a burning coal on their head. It'll be something that makes them feel uncomfortable because the, the balance isn't equal anymore. They were mean to you, now you be mean to them. So it's like, well, what's going on here? They're still being nice to me. A Chinese proverb I posted on Facebook uh, earlier today, it says, um, meet good with good, so that good can continue. Basically, I'm paraphrasing here. Right. Uh, but meet evil with good, so that good can be started. Um. Basically, in, in every situation, meet it with good. And you can go on Facebook for the exact quote, because I am paraphrasing. But it, that's basically the idea of it, so don't get too carried away here. Um, so bo uh, it'll bother their conscience. But then there's a second part to this verse here. Um, and the Lord will reward you. See, when, when God rewards those who do right, especially when they're treated wrong. God rewards those who do right. Because that's what he desires for them to do. See, God doesn't desire for us to weigh the hearts of everybody else around us, or weigh how everybody else is mistreating us, or weigh how whatever. God wants us to seek him ourselves. And it's easy to know that in your head, but then the next time that somebody mistreats you yeah. and you're tempted to react negatively, remember this. Because you'll find that knowing something is a lot different than putting it into practice in the moment. Yeah. Especially in the heat of the moment. That's a difficult thing to do. Uh -huh. Anyways, uh, so that takes us to 23. Uh, the north... Oh, did I say everything that I got? Oh, yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, the north wind brings forth rain... And a backbiting tongue, angry looks, and the idea here is just the effects of, of what it produces. When you when you backbite people, there are, there's going to be negative effects. You can't possibly be, be one of those complainers, one of those people who talk behind people's backs, um, be an untrustworthy, unfaithful person, and expect for everything to go well with you. If you do that, you will be met with angry looks. It'll be it'll go negatively for you, because sin doesn't produce something good all of a sudden. It's not like you know, well, I meant it in the nicest way. Um, in verse 24, it is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Now, if you remember, this is the same time that Proverbs says this in this exact same word. Yeah. Sometimes they'll be repeated, but it'll be slightly different. This is exactly the same. Chapter 21, verse 9, and chapter 25, verse 16. Okay, so 21, 9. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. The exact same thing. Yeah. What well, knew about that? He had like 300 of them. He, he knew. <laughs> he knew. Um, and the idea here... <laughs> oh my goodness. The idea here is... Um, 
peaceful loneliness is better than strife-filled companionship. That goes not just in marriage, that goes in life in general, too. Uh, that's a broader principle. It is better to be lonely and in that loneliness have peace than it is to find companions that don't bring any peace. You know what I mean? You can be surrounded by hundreds of people, and if all of them are backbiters and gossipers and whiners, and it's going to negatively affect you. You can't honestly expect to live in a house of strife and to not have strife in your heart. You know what I mean? So, anyways... But with that being said, if there is strife in your heart, you have to address the strife in your heart before you can find somebody to fill the hole. Because what we do is we, we try and find somebody who completes us. But if we don't go into marriage or into any really real friendship with a whole heart, with that completeness already in us, found in Christ, and we look to somebody else to fill that brokenness of us, it's not going to go very well. Because you're going to hold your spouse or your friend to a standard that they can never meet. See what I mean? You are an incomplete person and you're expecting somebody else to make you complete. But that's not, not how it works. It's just not how it works. And so if you're someone at war with your, within your own heart, don't look for people to, to bring uh, resolution to that. Verse 25. Like cold water to the thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. That one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, the good news is refreshing. Like a muddled spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. When a righteous man gives way before the wicked, it is like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain. Okay. Uh, verse 27, It is not good to eat much honey, nor is it glorious to seek one's own glory. Now, this one is another one that has a lot of different translations. If you look on your footnotes, it might have something along the lines of this. This is what mine says. The meaning of the Hebrew line is uncertain. If you have different Bibles, some of them will say that, some of them won't. And that's because that's exactly true. This this is just a, a, a mess of possible interpretations. So we're going to assume that what he's saying is a little bit of something is good. You know, if somebody gives you glory, it's good. But then if you try and seek your own glory, that's bad. Yeah. You know, just like honey, if you eat a little bit of honey, well, that's good. But if, if, you, if you fill up on honey, well, that's bad. He's kind of like that, um, and basically, don't once again, don't get over, don't overlook what he's saying here. The idea is not to seek one's own glory. Don't seek your own glory. Uh, verse twenty-eight: A man without self, which, by the way, is a bigger principle too, because a lot of people are in their jobs and in their uh, ministries to seek their own glory. You know, yeah. so a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Okay, now. That's a pretty big statement, okay? Because walls were the source of protection for cities in ancient times. That was how they were protected, by their walls. And so, for a man without self-control to be like a city who's not only been broken down and in, broken into, but who doesn't have the wall anymore, there's no protection. Self-control is a protection against, our, against the, the, the destruction of our souls. You understand what you're saying there? That's a powerful statement. And I think Solomon would know, as Chuck earlier mentioned, with the hundreds of wives. I right. think he would know a little bit something about failing with self-control. Right. Uh, verse 20, or Chapter 26, verse 1. Like snow in the summer or rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. Let I me mean, go for it. Did I mention that? Yeah, I did. Okay. Okay. And this is uh, something he's going to actually say here in a little bit, uh, again, about the sluggard. Um, but yeah, that was pretty simple, too. Verse uh, verse 2, like a sparrow in its flitting, like a swallow in its flying. Now, this one is increased, is extremely important because this directly applies to the superstitions of the day, okay? It, a curse that is causeless does not alight. What that means is if you've ever seen a, a bird, a sparrow who, like, flutters and it doesn't land, it gets close to it, but then it just keeps going? Kind of like that. That's that's a curse that's spoken out when it has no basis. Okay, and the idea here, blam, power is not in the curse or the blessing. I know some people make it out. Even today, this is a common superstition that curses and blessings they in itself have um, like an essence. You know, they take on. It's almost like they take on a form, and they either hover in the air or they go to the person. Nothing can negate that. And this proverb directly contradicts that. Okay, basically, what's saying is power is not in the curse, but in the and the one behind it. For instance, Balaam wanted to curse Israel. 
He attempted to curse Israel, but God prevented him from being able to curse Israel. See what I mean? Well, the curse, it would just be in the air, and then, it, no, that's not how curses work. So anytime that somebody puts a hex or a curse on you, you don't have to worry about it. Okay? Because we stand under the blood of Christ. Right. Obviously, if you open yourself up to witchcraft and you partake of it yourself, well, then you're going to have to... You're, not you're on your own, but no, you're going to have to repent of it and renounce Satan's work and you know seek right. after God to, to bring reconciliation in that situation. However, just a Christian doing what a Christian should do, not living in witchcraft, just you know doing what a Christian should do, there is nothing to fear in there. Um, and uh, on that note, though, w this this applies to more than just that. Basically, Christians don't have to be afraid of of curses or witchcraft or sorcery. We don't have to be afraid of any of that. Now, in the Kingdom of the Occult, Walter Martin says this story where um, say, uh, basically Satan worshippers went and killed a Christian. And some people came and said, well, I thought you said we didn't have to worry about, uh, that we didn't have to fear. And he said, no, no, no. You don't have to, you don't have to fear about, about the power of Satan over you. However, people do still kill people regardless of whether they worship Satan or themselves. Right. You know, and that's just a, a general truth. People do yeah. still kill us. They can't. St they can't hurt our, our soul. And that's what Jesus said. Don't be afraid of these people who can't, who can't, who can only hurt your body. Don't be afraid of them. But with that being said, Satan cannot get a, a hand over you, because once again we're under the power of Christ. So, right. um, so power is not in the curse or the blessing. This is extremely important. I really want you guys to get this proverb. This directly attacks the superstitions of the day, mm -hmm. and. It still applies to today when people still carry on those same superstitions, you know. And we really don't have to be afraid of these kinds of things. Okay. A curse that is causeless does not alight. A whip for the horse, a bridle, a bridle for the for the donkey, and a um, and a rod for the pack of fools. <laughs> this one's kind of simple. <laughs> Basically, you know, it, like he said was saying earlier, fools are undeserving of, of honor. That. The, they live foolishly, you know. If you give it to them, they wouldn't know what to do with it, anyways. You know, in, the, in that same same rod, it's it's like there isn't really a modern day equivalent. But think of um, think of someone who's in serious credit card debt. It's like, wow, credit card debt to the one who can't who, who can't wisely uh, manage his money. It's the same kind of an idea there. It's just something that goes hand in hand. A rod for the fool. In other words, it's just something that goes together because they, they don't learn. Um, verse, uh, I believe that's four. Answer not a fully according to his folly, lest you be like himself, your, him yourself, sorry, him yourself. And then verse five, directly contrast, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. That's right. It said, don't answer him according to his folly. And then it said, do answer him according to his folly. <laughs> yes, it did say that, okay? Uh -huh. So let's look at this. First off, don't do the same, same things as you despise in them. Wow. Fools are always shooting off their mouth. So what are you going to do? Shoot off your mouth? <laughs> don't answer a fool according to his folly because that's going to make you look like, look like uh, well, lest you be like him yourself. You, yeah. you in, a, in essence, will become like him. Uh, have you ever gotten mad at somebody for something and you just you just hate it, hate it in the heart? You just despise them for doing that. And then you end up doing the same thing? Have you guys ever done that? Um, there was someone, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, who, uh, <laughs> this is a true story. Their father was extremely strict on them and he always expected uh, perfection of them. Nobody's ever had a father like that, right? <laughs> and uh, so then they ended up, ended up, ended up uh, becoming angry with their father. And uh, basically, not really important the details, but after after a while, somebody said to him, he said, "Well, aren't you expecting perfection out of your father? Because he messed up. You're carrying around this bitterness because he expected you to be perfect, so you were expecting him to be perfect and not expecting you to be perfect." See, so it's, it's the exact same thing that he was mad at his father for that he was doing to his father, yeah. lest you become like him yourself. See, what I mean, so. Um. But then the second part of this of this answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. One should not, and this is a quote from Alan Ross. Uh, he wrote a commentary on Proverbs. Uh, one should not lower oneself to the level of a fool. But there are times when the lesser of two evils is to speak out. 
Human problems are often complicated and cannot be solved by following a single rule. So this gives the wide spectrum of it, of the different, sometimes you have to say something, but then sometimes it's better not to say something. So, um, I think that kind of explains it. Any questions about that? No? We're good? Okay, cool. Uh, verse 20, wait, uh, 7, I guess. Let me see. No, 6? Yeah, 6. Uh, whoever sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off his own feet and drinks violence. Not good. <laughs> Don't hire a fool. I know a lot of people say, well, I gave him a position in the church so that way he'd get more on fire for God. That doesn't work. Well, I, are you okay, friend? Do you need something? We have Tylenol. We have a child's hammer. Here's the I inhaled some hairspray and I'm feeling good. You need to go outside? Okay. Well, just wave me down if you decide you need something, okay? Um. Okay, so don't hire a fool. Okay. Like a, a lame man's legs. <laughs> which I think this is funny because Chuck mentioned this earlier. Like a lame man's legs which hang useless is the proverb of the mouth of fools. <laughs> what are the odds? Uh, anyways, uh, like one who binds the stone in the sling is one who gives honor to a fool. Yes, you heard that correctly. Binding a stone in the sling. In other words, tying a rock in a sling. Well, how can you use a sling if the stone is tied into it? Um, so, first off, there's two kind of ideas here. The first is the idea of, of trying to get it to, to do something that's not uh, doing, like a fool, you know, trying to get them to change their ways that they're not really going to do, like just like you were with, with a sling, trying to, well, I'm trying to get the sling ready, and the stone keeps falling out, so I'm just going to tie it in there. Well, I'm trying to help this fool, and he just keeps not listening to me, so I'm just going to try and, it's not going to work. But then there's a second idea, too. Um, the person who's doing this doesn't understand the nature of slings. Just as the person who, um, where is it in verse seven, um, 8, just as the same who, one who, who, who gives honor to a fool doesn't understand fools. Um, so trying to make a fool not a fool or giving honor is counterproductive and it's stupid. Yeah. It's going to actually go the opposite way because when you give a fool honor, he gets more foolish. You understand that? Mm -hmm. It's a big thing that parents often do with their children. Their children will, will, will sleep and uh, step into foolishness, getting arrested and doing all these different things. And so the, the, then the parent will have this idea that maybe if I bail them out, maybe if I help them, it'll make them get better. And the truth is, you're, you're, the child made the decision to either be foolish or to be wise. You gave them, you gave them the, their discipline, you gave them their encouragement, but now that they're an adult, it's time to let them make their decisions. And what your job is to do is to pray for them and, uh, do you need a pillow maybe? Would that help? My heart rate's just going up. Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, and then also it's just a stupid thing to do. Just like it would be the same to tie a stone into a sling. It's just a stupid thing to do. Um, because that takes us to verse 9. Like a thorn that goes up into the hand of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of fools. Now, I want you to imagine the picture. Have you ever seen somebody really drunk? Yeah, kind of like this, you know? Yeah. So now I imagine them taking hold of a thorn bush. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Like a thorn that goes up into the hand of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of fools. It's 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 going to do harm to themselves. Mm -hmm. They're not going to get it. it, it just, it's just going to cause bad things. Bad things. Like an archer who wounds everyone is one who hires a passing fool or drunkard. Do not hire foolish people. You know, once again, going back to the example that I was that I was starting to mention before about hiring somebody into the onto a church board to, to, to make them more spiritual, or you know, hiring someone because all that they need is, is a job. And it's like, no, they're too foolish to have a job. They're going to do you more harm than good. Um, which is why I say, don't always put your name as the reference on people getting jobs. <laughs> if someone's not a good worker, they're a foolish person when it comes to that kind of stuff. Don't tarnish your name with their, with their stupidity. Like, let them make their own decisions. If they really want to change, they can change. I'm not saying you should write people off. Always be there to help people. Always be there to... But there comes a, there comes a time when there's no reason why you should destroy your name. You see what I mean? Because they're not going to listen either way. And that's where wisdom comes in. But the, the once again, what earlier in Proverbs mentioned, the, 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 the bad thing about wisdom is oftentimes it causes us to become prideful. Okay, 
So we really got to watch out for that. Okay. Um, like Okay, so verse 11. Like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Uh, uh, who here has owned a dog? You do. You? Maybe? A uh, little. Little? Bye. Have you guys ever had a dog that threw up? Goes right back to it. Yeah. And eats it. And eats it. Yeah. That's because a fool, a fool returns to his folly. See what I mean? That's just what he does. He repeats it. And just like the, the throw up, it's a it's a vile thing. <laughs> um, but there's no discretion, so obviously he's not able to discern, I guess. Um, where is it? Verse 12. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. I love that. The sluggard says, there's a line in the road, there's a line in the streets. And the idea here is that full, uh, uh, lazy people, they find reasons to not work. Mm -hmm. There's a line in the street, I really can't go to work. You don't understand, I can't go to work today, it's raining. I can't go to work today, I, I have a cold. I can't go to work today because, see, I mean, it, it's, the, it's the ways of laziness. That's just yeah. how it goes. Um... At 14, as a door as a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. He's not willing to actually put forth the effort to be disciplined about stuff. Verse 15, the sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. <laughs> See what I mean? Like, <laughs> and the idea here is that, and well, a few things. First off, a, a lazy person finds reasons not to do the job. Right. Or they call... They always have these billion one excuses as to how they could do it a better a better job, you know. Um, now, are those like S three that we read? Are they in there before also? Somewhere else? Uh, hold on. One of these is real similar. That as a door turns on it, on its hinges is very similar to. Oh, one. I thought the line in the street yeah, the one. Um, I Do think, you know, I thought that it was a sli slightly worded different in that, but you know what? It might and be burying his hand in the dish. I thought those were worded slightly different, but if you would like, I can check. But they're very close. Yeah, it's the same meaning. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, but I would like—I I should look that up. If I if I remember, I'll look that up because it, it you know. Um. Anyways, and then the second idea here: uh, they're unfinished tasks. Lazy people start things. Lazy people are all about starting things. Yeah. People think that lazy people are people who are just born lazy and they sit there on the couch all day. That's completely untrue. Uh, sometimes lazy people even have a job. Imagine that. But lazy people are people who who they have this drive, but they just don't stick with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, they they want to do something great, but they just, just don't see it through. Mm -hmm. Or they spend fifteen hours trying to come up with an easier way to do a one hour job. Yes. And yeah. never get it done. Yes, yes. exactly. That's right. the idea of a lazy person. Sometimes you will meet those lazy people who just don't even get out of bed. Sometimes they do exist, guys. Yeah. They really do. However. Lazy people walk among us. Yeah. I see lazy people. <laughs> um, uh, then third off, they, um, they like it. I already mentioned that. Um, and they get sidetracked when they are doing something. <laughs> uh -huh. And laziness doesn't just come with work. It comes with ministry. You see a lot of pastors who are lazy. You see a lot of pastors who are lazy. Um, you know, and some of that is, is somewhat justified, like just getting burnt out in ministry. Um, getting depressed in ministry, you know those kinds of things. I'm, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to make this black and white. There are things that look like laziness and are just not laziness. De severe depression may look like laziness to some people, but it's not. It's depression. You know what I mean? So, so keep things in, in balance here. However, then there are genuinely lazy ministers, and you see a lot of times. No offense, Chuck. I'm not even talking about you. Okay. <laughs> a lot of times it is either a youth pastor or a children's church leader. A lot of times. Not all the time. But a lot of times, and then you see the senior pastor try and uh, cover for it, so they'll work extra hard for the. Whereas if they would have all worked together, yeah. they would have all had to just do an equal amount, and it would have been better. Once again, I'm not talking about Jucker and Chucker Gracie, okay? Not talking about that at all, <laughs> okay? So I, I was actually talking to the pastor about a, um, a pastor here recently who had to fire most of his staff. Because they just weren't working together, <laughs> and it was more destructive for the church to keep them on staff than it was to fire them. So, you know, that kind of stuff happens. Um, okay, uh, that puts us at verse like 16 or something, right? The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. This is exactly what Chuck just said. 
15 hour, 15 hours trying to figure out how to do it easier rather than just doing it. Right. They're wise and they're nice. They, I've got, they've got all this figured out. I just, I, I got this. I got yeah. it. I got it. I don't need, I don't need you to tell me how to do it. You see this happen all the time. Uh, a Walmart employee, you know, the the manager will tell them to do something. They'll think, well, that's stupid, and so they'll try and argue with them, or they'll just do it their own way, anyways. You're hired to do your job. Right. As an associate pastor, I'm not hired to cast vision for the church. I'm not hired to make decisions, uh, you know, financial decisions and those kinds. Of, I'm not hired to do that. I'm hired to do what the pastor tells me to do and to help him do what he wants to do. That's the job of an associate pastor. Mm -hmm. If I don't like it, then I should quit. Right. That's how it goes. Because that's the sign of laziness. An associate pastor who takes a job and then complains the whole time about their boss. That's laziness. Just do what they hired you to do. They're paying you either way. What do you care about how they do it? Right. I got a perfect, perfect, perfect example of this. I was going on a walk today, and I'm not trying to super spiritualize this thing, but I really felt like God wanted me to walk down a certain street, so I was walking down, this, down the street. And I saw this older gentleman and, and his el elder wife uh, working on their yard. And I was going to walk up and help them, uh, or offer, offer my help, I should say, but they were doing something, and I was going to suggest that, that you know if they waited till the next morning, I could do it for them. Uh, or you know if they did it this other way, it would probably work better. And instantly as I thought that, God said, right there. You don't go and help somebody else do what they're doing and then tell them how to do it. Right. That's an associate pastor who takes a job as an associate pastor and then tells the pastor how he's doing it wrong. Yeah. That's exactly the thing. He's doing this work, and you can't come in there. And it's not just a ministry, because not everybody here is a ministry. No. Um, uh, it, it's in work, too, where you go, and you try and tell your boss how to do his job better. You try and nag him about everything. Just do the job you're hired to do. Um, so it's with work. It's with ministry. Uh, it's with studying. We can become lazy with studying. You know, God wants us to, to not be ignorant to what's going on around us. Be, be a diligent studier. Um, you know, it might be the heat, too, Nicole. Can you get, like, something cool, Grace? Like an ice pack or something? Anything really will help, I think. Well, we could stab you in the heart, and that would get it to stop. But I don't think it's what you'd want us to do. Um, it also is, it comes with taking care of issues. Sometimes we can just become lazy with dealing with stuff. You know, like that, that phone bill that's... You know, they overcharge you for And you're just like, I don't want to deal with this. So we don't. The car maintenance is like, I don't want to deal with this. So we don't. I mean, laziness is something that, that takes root in places in our hearts and it just starts spreading. Yeah. Well, one thing is like with, okay, like with studying whatever, like we, we all have times where we don't want to do it, you know, uh -huh. or, you know, we, we could be doing something we'd rather be doing or whatever mm -hmm. that. But it's a matter of are you going to make the decision to do it, or are you just going to give in to whatever you want to do? Mm hmm Absolutely. Your alarm's going off. Yeah, she's going to get it. Okay. Verse 17, whoever meddles in a quarrel not his own, not his own, is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. What does that mean? It's a gamble. It might blow up in your face, or it might not. Sometimes a dog's really nice, you pull it by the ears, and it's just like, huh. Uh, okay. Or sometimes it's something that latches on real hard to your hand and it won't let go. Yeah. Ah! Have you guys ever seen Scrooge with Norm MacDonald? You seen it? Where he goes to steal the dog and the dog bites his hand. He's all flinging it. Ah! <laughs> and the blood spraying everywhere. <laughs> Anyways, I'm, yeah. I'm getting um, uh, metal. And, and you know, the thing the thing is here here in the Hebrew, um, once again, I don't know Hebrew, so I'm going by other commentators. Right. Um, it's, it seems to be implying uh, when you take on someone else's anger, for instance. It's like someone who pass, who uh, grabs a dog, a passing dog by the ears. <coughs> Verse eighteen. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows and death, <coughs> is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, "I am only joking." Practical jokes are warned against in Scripture. Now, obviously, he's not saying you can't joke. Right. But there comes a point of that's not funny anymore, you know, Going and uh, yeah, and and so that's what this is talking about. The the, the I guess you could even call them impractical jokes. Uh -huh. It's joking that goes too far. It's something that doesn't go well. <clears throat> uh, 
Or what I used to do when I was a kid is I'd do something real douche and I'd just tag just kidding at the end of it and that, that would make it okay because I was just kidding. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, for lack of wood, the fire goes out and where there is no whisperer, a quarreling ceases. That, that one pretty much, much makes sense. You really don't have to dig too deep on that one. Um, so then verse 21, As charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. If fights start everywhere with everyone, then it's probably you. <laughs> and Farber says that elsewhere like this, don't hang around people who are basically who are short-tempered because you'll pick up on their ways. And that kind of goes with a lot of things in life. We kind of pick up who we're around. Yeah. If you want to be godly, be around people who love God. Not people who want to love God. Not people who pretend to love God. Not people who, who are real religious. But people who just love God. Okay. Now, obviously, that means that they have to be part of the Sons of God Church or they don't really love God. Yes. No, that's not what it means. No. See what I mean? It's not about religious or how they look. It's about whether what their heart is set on. <clears throat> Some people look real good, but they're actually just very greedy people. <clears throat> Some people pretend to be rich, but they're actually just living on pennies. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? And so their arrogance is going to rub off on you. Do you always have to be around rich, up, upper class people? You can't stand the poorer people? Are you always around the poor people and can't stand rich people? Mm. See what I mean? The, the people who we're around rub off on us and we'll start picking up their negative attitudes. Because, you know, tra attitudes transfer a whole lot quicker than words. Mm -hmm. You can hear a hundred words and not learn a thing. You can feel one feeling and completely change for the rest of your life. Uh -huh. Never forget that. The things that we, the, the attitudes that we have will transfer a lot faster. You want your kids to be patient? Don't teach them to be patient. Show them patience. Um, verse 22. The words of a whisperer, I'm sorry, I think I read about that. No I, no, I did not. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. This one is very similar to one that we, lo that we already looked at as well. Um, and the idea there is not condoning it. It's just saying that people who gossip, it's like a tasty, tasty morsel. But pastors also talked about this multiple times, so I don't really feel, feel the need to. Like the glaze covering an earthen vessel, this is another one that has multiple translations. One, for instance, depending on your Bible, might say silver of dross. I'm sorry, um, yes, yeah, silver of dross. Does anybody's Bible say that? Um, well, some, some say different things. And this one, I think, makes most sense out of all of them, so I'm not really going to... Like I said, these ones are kind of get a little bit harder to understand, so I'm not going to do a survey of all the different ways that they could be read. If you buy a bunch of Bibles and you do it and you have fun, I'm not going to waste the time with that. Now, uh, like the glaze covering an earthen vessel are fervent lips with an evil heart. And the idea here, I think I wrote it down. Boop. Fervent is basically passionate. Somebody can can, sound, can, can can talk a good talk, but then their heart is just not... Yeah. Somebody can be evil in their heart, but sound like they're good. If you ever read um, uh, Shakespeare... Um, oh crap! I forget what it's called, but his right hand man ended up uh, Iago ends up uh, betraying him. Which one was that? Um, Macbeth, maybe. I thought it started with an H, but it might be Macbeth. Hamlet. I think it was Hamlet. You guys, is anybody here familiar with with Shakespeare? A little bit. It might be one of those two. Well, anyways, when Iago betrays him, anyways. Uh, so then, um, <sighs> that's gonna bug me. Are you looking that up, Nicole? No. Oh, okay. I'll look, I'll look it up. Or Chuck, can you look that up? Just look up which Shakespeare play is Iago in, because that's really gonna bug me, guys. Right. Um, anyways. Um. Okay. So like the glaze covering. Okay. So okay. So that's verse twenty-four. Whoever hates disguises himself with his lips and harbors deceit in his heart. And uh, the the idea here, I didn't actually write it down. That's a bummer. Okay. Well, the idea here, anyways, um, sometimes, how do I want to say this? Othello. Othello. Oh. That's right, it is. Oh, you. You. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Guys, I never would have guessed that in a million years. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it's been so long since I read it. Um, anyways. Verse 24. Whoever hates disguises himself with his lips and harbors deceit in his heart. And there is one part that was very similar to this early on, uh, probably around like chapter 12 or something. But uh, there was something I wanted to mention about this, and I didn't write it down, unfortunately. Um... I remember what. Sometimes we'll we'll, we will use um, our bad attitude to, to, and the way pe people treat us to justify things. You know? And uh, actually, I think I did write that one down. Okay, yeah, I did write that one down. I just wrote it around a different proverb. So I'm not going to... I'll come back to that then when I get to that proverb. Um, so then... Uh, 25. Well, I, there's something else I want to say about 24 besides that. Um, sometimes when people have a bad attitude, they'll kind of overcompensate with the words that they say. On a side note, it's just a little something extra there. Uh, verse 25, then, when he, spoke, when he speaks graciously, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Now, le these verses are all kind of connected loosely. So we're going to look at them a little bit in, in hand in hand. Uh, seven abominations is not an actual count. It basically, in Hebrew, it oftentimes mean, means countless. Repeatedly. Okay. Seven oftentimes has the idea of completion or uh, cont continuity. Like when Jesus says, how, when Peter asks Jesus, how many times do you have to, have to forgive him? Seventy times seven. The idea of an ongoing process is something that you need to keep doing. Um, it's not actually a, a count. Um, so sometimes in, in Hebrew, they'll have a literal number. Sometimes it'll be more poetical. And you have to watch out. And sometimes they'll round the numbers, and sometimes they'll be precise about their numbers. Like if you go through numbers, there's this one part where it specifically says an exact number. There's no zeros in it. It goes to the number. Then every other number in number in the book of numbers is rounded to the, to the nearest yeah. 10 or 100. Every other number. Yeah. Why? Do you know what I mean? And that's how Hebrew works. The, the, some people have, gone, have, have made the argument that, he, that Hebrew people were extremely uh, precise with their record. No, that's just not true. Uh -huh. they, that was that's absolutely not true. Um, they rounded a lot. They, they, they used some, sometimes they used numbers that weren't meant to be precise to the time. And they didn't see a problem with that. You know, so we need to keep that in mind um, when we're studying the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So when he speaks graciously, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. His heart is wicked. Uh, though his hatred be covered with deception, his wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. Uh, the assembly is in public. Okay, that's the modern day equivalent. The assembly back then would be associated with, um, you know, the, the synagogue. So the idea here, or also with the with the judgment. Um, since they didn't have a courthouse, they had the synagogue. The synagogue was actually a very important uh, piece of, of, of Israelite culture. It, it was where a lot of things happened. You know, it, it, it was where they had their, their fest, uh, festivities. It's where they had their sacrifices. Um, it's where they had uh, the, the, the teaching would be done at the synagogue. Uh, you know, if your son was in was was being trained in the, in the Torah. He would be trained in this, at the synagogue. The synagogue was just a, a center for that. Uh, religious cases, or I'm sorry, um, uh, law cases, legal cases, would be done at the synagogue. Uh, when Jesus was arrested, they took him uh, to the synagogue. Anyways, um, verse 26, Though his hatred be covered with deception, his wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. Um, so then that's 27, Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and a stone will come back on him who starts it rolling. Uh, I mean that one's pretty simple. Uh, the idea of you know things coming back when you when you plan destruction for other people, it comes back on you. And then verse twenty eight: A lying tongue hates his victims, and a flattering mouth works ruin. Which is what I was going to say earlier on verse twenty five: Hatred justifies wrong done. When when somebody uh, uh, when somebody hates somebody, they'll justify why it's okay for them to do the wrong to them because you know it, it it's different because this person's just a pain, you know, and. Uh, yeah. Um, I believe that's all that we were going to look at for this tonight. That stops us on 27. Um, I guess that is it. I, I want to say that there's something I'm missing, but I'm sure it'll come to me later. 
or I won't, and I'll just forget about it, and I'll be able to sleep at night because I forgot. Uh, question of the week: How do you know if you are a person of good character? How do you know if you if you have good character? Like, what do you what do you think? So, um, 